Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Wednesday, January 10th, 2024. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Alex Press, staff writer from the Jacobin, writes on labor organizing on the year, labor year in review, 2023, maybe a preview of 2024. Then Bill McKibben, contributing writer at the New Yorker and founder of thirdact.org, on the odd silence at the end of humanity's hottest year so far. Also on the program today, Blinken embarrassed in Israel as Netanyahu government tells him they want to ethnic cleanse Gaza right to his face. Israel continues to push for a full-scale war with Hezbollah in Lebanon federal appeals court seems skeptical and probably of with good reason of trump's immunity claims as he warns of bedlam if he loses the 2024 election speaking of losing the 2024 election desantis and haley go head to head in iowa tonight the not so thriller in Iowa. Uh -huh. With uh, food, drug, safety services, and Viet uh, veterans assistance set to run out of money in nine days, Congress looks towards another continuing resolution as they bandy about their agreement. As we speak, Republicans hold their first impeachment meeting. Uh, today uh, over impeaching Alejandro Mayorkas. Second trans woman campaign uh, challenged in Ohio over her dead name. FCC warns that government program that provides 23 million with discounts on high-speed internet to expire soon. Cal State faculty to strike for five days at 23 campuses in California. And the USDA expects 21 million kids to be fed by a new program that provides free lunch during the summer. All this and more on today's Majority Report. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Emma out today, although she'll be here tonight. Um, at the moment, we are planning to do coverage of the... Um, DeSantis Haley almost, debate. You almost don't even need to say who's going to be involved because everyone's so excited and anticipating. I know that. it. I have real uh, misgivings about doing this tonight. Despite but... Doug Burgum and Vivian <clears throat> Ramaswamy not being there. Yes, and also, I mean, we there's no um, Asa Hutchinson, no Chris Christie. Ouch. Yeah. Yep. Don't remind me. Um, we may be doing that. We will see. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Hunter Biden, I should just say, um, showed up at the hearing about his not answering a subpoena. Mm. The big issue is, of course, that uh, Biden wants to testify in public and the Republicans want him to testify in secret. And it, it should be clear as to why they want him to testify in secret so that they can leak and control how the American public hears his testimony 
and he wants to do it in public so that the American public can hear his testimony. Um, uh, you know, I think you should, if you're subpoenaed by Congress, you should go. That's my uh, general feeling. What makes um, you wonder what he's hiding? It, that he only wants to tell people about it in public. In public, in yep. front of everybody, yeah. Exactly. Um, but uh, more on that maybe later. Uh, in the meantime, Donald Trump was in a um, federal appeals uh court in uh dc yesterday and his lawyer attorney d john sauer um is making the case to judge florence pan that um donald trump if he's engaged in a an official act as president which Theoretically, you know, most of those acts are, um, I mean, if you ask somebody to do something, um, and, uh, that he should have immunity from prosecution unless somehow he's been impeached for it and the impeachment would, uh, you know, and, and not just impeached, but convicted. Um, and, uh, it doesn't take a very creative hypothetical for the judge to completely befuddle this lawyer. Listen to this. This is pretty amazing. Could a president order SEAL Team 6 to assassinate a political rival? That's an official act in order to SEAL Team 6? He, he would have to be and would speedily be, you know, uh, uh, impeached and convicted before the criminal what prosecution. If you weren't, what if you weren't? There would be no criminal prosecution, no criminal liability for that? Chief Justice's opinion in Marbury against Madison and uh, uh, and our constitutional tradition and the plain language of the impeachment judgment clause all clearly presuppose that what the founders were concerned about was not. I asked you a yes no yes or no question. Could a president who ordered SEAL Team Six to assassinate a political rival who was not impeached would he be subject to criminal prosecution? If he were impeached and convicted first, and so, so your answer is. Is, no. is my answer is qualified yes there's a political process that would have to occur under our the structure of our constitution which would require impeachment and conviction by the senate in these exceptional cases as the olc memo itself points out from the department of justice you'd expect a speedy impeachment and conviction but what the founders were much more worried about than using criminal prosecution to discipline presidents was what uh james madison calls in federalist number 47 the you know the, the newfangled and artificial treasons they were much more concerned about the abuse of the criminal process for political purposes to disable the presidency from factions and political opponents. And of course, that's exactly what we see in this case. I've, I've asked you a, a series of hypotheticals about criminal actions that could be taken by a president and could be considered official acts. And I've asked you, would such a president be subject to criminal prosecution if he's not impeached or convicted? Requirement. And your answer, your yes or no answer is no. I, I believe I said qualified yes if he's impeached or convicted first. Uh, we my my question thing. was, okay, so he's not impeached or conviction, been convicted. Let's put that aside. You're saying a president could sell pardons, could sell military secrets, could order SEAL Team 6 to assassinate a, a political rival. Sale of military secrets strikes me as something that might not be held to be an official act. The sale of pardons is something that's come up historically okay. and was not prosecuted. But your brief so, says that communicating with an executive branch agency is an official act. And communicating with a foreign government is an official act. That's what presidents do. They're very strange situation. There's very strange examples of potential official acts. If you look at what Chief Justice Mitchell said in against Madison, he said, rising directly under Article Two, Section One, that the uh, uh, the courts that the president's official acts are quote never examinable by the courts. And he says it like four different times on pages one sixty four to one sixty six. Well, let me ask Madison. you about that then, counsel, because your position is, as I understand it. If a president is impeached or convicted, impeached and convicted by Congress, then he is subject to criminal prosecution, correct? That would be unnecessary. Is that to execution? Is that a yes? Yes. yes? Okay. So therefore, he's not completely and absolutely immune because under the procedure that you concede, he can be prosecuted if there's an impeachment and conviction by the Senate. Very, very formidable structural check against the astonishing radical action of prosecuting a former president. 
Um, I went to law school for a year, and what we call this, um, this is a very legalistic uh, term, he's being evasive. <laughs> and he is afraid to answer the question. Um, <laughs> here is Donald Trump making another case. Now, I don't know if they made this case in the uh, court case today, but here is Donald Trump. Uh, pop this up on the screen if you can. Uh, without immunity, Donald Trump um, truthed on Truth Social, it would be very hard for a president to enjoy his or her golden years of retirement. They would be under siege by radical, out-of-control prosecutors, much like I am, without the retirement, but without the retirement. Uh, so I'm not sure if he's arguing that if you're going to retire, you get uh, immunity. Or it, just in general, you need to be uh, get immunity after the fact. Um, um, just a one note for Trump: like you are not retired; you're actively running for your old job back. <laughs> well, that's that's why it was sort of a, a confusing. Not just um, a ridiculous uh, comment. I mean, you could also say that like you should not, you should just not, you should be immune from prosecution of any crime if you're retired. Period. Not, not even as a president. If you're just trying to re enjoy your retirement, the key, the perfect crime, of course, in this instance, would be to commit a crime on the 364th day of your 65th year and uh, kill your political rival, for instance, <laughs> or rob a bank. Uh, and as long as you can get into retirement at age 65, um, my sense is he's going to be found not to be immune in this instance. Uh, now, uh, is there going to be any real world implications for that? Probably not in this instance, although it is a good precedent to set so that presidents can't feel like they can get away with criminal acts. Um, there's just one more point of accountability uh so hopefully going forward maybe we'll see a little bit less uh, don't hold your breath in a moment we're going to be talking uh to alex press about the year 2023 in labor then we'll be talking to bill mckibben about uh the hottest year we've ever had and how nobody's talking about it but before we do a word from our sponsor and just a reminder it's your support that makes this show possible. You can become a member at jointhemajorityreport.com. And when you do, you not only get the uh, free show uh, free of commercials, you get the fun half. So uh, please, if you are someone who enjoys the show uh, with some regularity, uh, jointhemajorityreport.com. It is our members that allow us to survive and thrive. Um, sponsor today came to us like years ago. And uh, I've said this before. I tried to get uh, Michael, if you see if he wanted to uh, use the product. It's for uh, folks who have thinning hair. And um, works for both men and women. In fact, I, I, know, I may know more women who have taken it than, uh, than men. But at the time, Michael didn't want to, uh, w wasn't interested. And I'm not, there was a lot of issues there. And, um, and they came, and, and we still had a couple of bottles around. And uh, at one point, I started feeling like I was getting a little thing on this side of my head, for whatever reason, more so on this side. And uh, I started taking it. And the thing about Nutrafol is that there's, um, there's no drugs. There's no compromises. It's just, it's just better hair. Uh, thicker hair helps with just the hair growth in general, obviously. Like, uh, and, and for me, it's about uh, sort of maintenance. You get up to my age, like something like 80% of uh, men have uh, thinning hair at one point. When you get up to my age, you just, uh, you're staving off. And these are, um, uh, Nutrol are hair growth supplements. They are physician formulated, 100% drug-free ingredients. Their patented technology provides consistent, reliable results without compromising your sex life. Um, and the thing about Nutrafol is a, a lot of supplements will just rely on the studies that are done about the ingredients. So if there's X, Y, or Z in this, they just look for studies that are done on X 
not necessarily combined with Y, et cetera, et cetera. Nutrafol clinically tests its final formulations to ensure their efficacy. In a clinical study, 84% of men showed improvement in their hair after six months of taking Nutrafol's men's hair growth supplements. Um, super easy. You can uh, purchase online. There is no prescription uh, necessary, no doctor visits required. Free shipping, automated delivers, uh, deliveries if you want. Again, you will see results in three to six months. Nutrafol is the number one dermatologist recommended hair growth supplement brand with over one me million people seeing thicker, stronger, faster growing hair with less shedding. I notice it when I'm, uh, when I have a white towel. That's when I notice it the most. Uh, take the first step to visibly thicker, healthier hair. For a limited time, Nutrafol is offering our listeners $10 off your first month subscription and free shipping. When you go to Nutrafol.com slash men, enter the promo code TMR. Find out why over 4,000 healthcare professionals recommend Nutrafol for healthier hair. Nutrafol.com slash men, spelled N-U-T-R-A-F-O-L dot com slash men. Enter the promo code TMR. That's Nutrafol.com slash men, promo code TMR. We will put the uh, link in the podcast and YouTube and uh, descriptions. Uh, Going to take a quick break. When we come back, Alex pra uh, Press, staff writer at the Jacobin, about the year in labor that just was. We are back, Sam Cedar. The Majority Report, Emma Viglin is off today. I want to welcome uh, back to the program Alex Press, contributing, uh, or I should say staff writer at Jacobin on all things uh, labor uh, and more, maybe? I don't know. Yes. Um, uh, uh, thanks so much for joining us. Um, you did a uh, retrospective of 2023 in terms of uh, of of labor uh, actions and uh, the U.S. working class, give us in a nutshell, um, uh, summarize for us, like what where was 2023 in the context of of maybe the past 50 years, but also the past like say decade. Sure. So the big, the easy to remember number about 2023 is that just over 500,000 workers went on strike in the United States. Um, that was double the number that went on strike in 2022, which itself was double what 2021 saw. So in that sense, that one's an easy trend to keep track of there. Um, you weren't just crazy. It's true that workers were striking at like crazy numbers, right? I mean, the biggest strikes here, of course, the UAW stand-up strike, the Hollywood strikes by the actors and the writers, the near strike by the Teamsters at UPS. We can go into some of this stuff, but there were strikes everywhere, especially in the private sector. And that's the other key takeaway is that in the United States, unionization is really low. We know this. It's about 10 percent right now. That masks the fact that in the public sector, about one in three workers are in a union. In the private sector, it's six percent total. So the, when you have all these strikes in the private sector, it shows something is really going on. These are not this is not the power center of American labor. And yet that's where workers are striking. As far as the longer view of things, you know, we saw a big uptick. We saw those teacher strikes in the public sector just before the pandemic. That was pretty significant. Um, but going back several years before that, you know, we haven't seen kind of the mass strikes and the mass near strikes that we saw this past year. 
you know, I've been describing it kind of loosely as a way to convey to people that it feels like things are adding up to more than the sum of their parts, right? You know, the unionization rate's still low. We can get into the problems with labor law and stuff. But you're starting to see that, like, workers are pent up. They're mad. They went through the pandemic in ways that we can discuss, you know, really, I think, clarified the lines of who's in charge in the workplace and who has to take on risk for that person in charge. Um, and that's what's leading to all of this organizing. You know, the one num other number I give as far as full perspective, you know, early 20th century stuff is right after World War II, we saw something like one in 10 workers go on strike. We're talking about millions and millions of workers. That was, you know, the years of World War II where they had pledged not to strike. Problems were just festering and it exploded in World War II. Um, and I think the comparison to the present is not in the same numbers. We don't have millions of people striking. But we do have this shared experience collectively as a country of how COVID hit. That is not exactly the same as what World War II was, the experience was like if you were in the U.S., but is this very extreme rewiring of your sense of what the world is, how it works, and what you're going to put up with. Um, I think the analogy does have some, some accuracy to how people are feeling now. All right, so I have two questions uh, to follow up on that. Um, the 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 first being that, in, and I think it was in, in 1945 or 1946, somewhere around there, there was something like, I don't know, 5 million, you, you said the number in the context of, of number of workers, but it was something like 5 million people. And, and I guess our, our, but you know, our population at that time was probably closer to uh, 120, 140 million people or something. It was probably half of what it is today. Right. So, right. so we're talking about five, you know, really 5% of that number relative to, to, to uh, that time. But uh, mm -hmm. labor laws have changed. And like you say, our uh, uh, union density is down. Um, so two questions. One, um, and, and they're, they're a little bit disparate, but one, how much of that knock-on effect could you see coming out of World War II as a prediction as to whether this will carry through? And then sort of a related question is, how much of this is, I mean, I think COVID, you're right, is, was and without a doubt an accelerant and an acute um, uh, sort of um, impetus for this. But also, it seems to me, that really, like starting in 2011 with that Chicago teachers uh, strike, and then through the Red uh, State Rebellion that uh, took place, I guess it was 2015, maybe it was, 2016, yeah. like around there, um, there, there, and just generationally speaking, um, you know, following Occupy, there feels like there is a, a greater consciousness that COVID... Uh, COVID didn't take advantage of, but that was, was pre-existing to COVID. And so I wonder mm -hmm. like where you, you see the, how much of a trajectory you think we're on at this point. Yeah. I mean, that is the longer story I tell basically, Sam, is that C CTU serves as this kind of pole of what would a left wing kind of socially progressive community conscious union look like. You know, when you go in, into all of these newer strikes or new organizing campaigns, you often end up encountering CTU. Like someone will tell you they learned from a CTU person or they were at a labor notes training, labor notes conference um, with some CTU members. So I think that's totally right to include them in the story. Um, and then, you know, the shorter term story I tell is, you know, Occupy, as much as we uh, is sort of publicly just derided as having accomplished nothing, you know, it one really introduced the language and the consciousness of inequality um, it back into a country where class politics and class language were largely lost. The idea that like politics and inequality is something you can go out and talk about and have a role in changing rather than something you kind of watch on TV when Barack Obama speaks or something. That was key. Um, I was a part of that movement, of course. So a I'm lot of organizers, I think like yeah. today, were, were, you know, either first or second generation from Occupy, it seems right. to me. Right. So the story I tell, I'll try to keep it short-ish, but, you know, then you go through and you have two other strands that I think are important. One being the Bernie Sanders campaigns of 2016 and 2020. I can't tell you how often I'm talking to a, someone who just organized a new union or is part of a strike. And they'll tell me if I start asking about, why are you doing this? You know, the odds are against you. Why bother with this? They'll say, well, you know, I was a big Sanders supporter in 2016. And he said that, you know, unions are kind of the engine for all the other transformations we want in society and that working class people are the most important people in the country and you know they'll say i took those lessons to heart 
So when those Sanders campaigns wound down, it's not like people just went into despair and became apolitical again, especially the young supporters. Many of them went and took jobs at Amazon and started trying to organize, or they became union staffers and decided to devote themselves to strengthening workers' power. You know, this is a real through line. And then the third, the third strand um, that operates, you know, I think in a similar fashion is the, the endless kind of uprisings against police brutality in the U.S., especially 2020 that summer. A lot of people, that was their first time getting brought into a movement, demanding change in a huge sector of the economy, saying that the violence of the state is not acceptable. It's not like you kind of wind those opinions back in when you clock into work. All of a sudden, when you have a racist manager at your job, you're going to take the experiences you had in your in the movement and say, this is not OK. And that often ends up being the, the sort of opening story for a new union campaign. If you start talking to the workers, eventually you'll get back to there was a discriminatory boss or I had this you know manager who did X, Y and Z. So these things, I think, really are kind of building on each other. And as for where it goes, I don't know. But given that kind of years long lineage, it's not like it disappears when COVID kind of tamps down in the country. Well, let's also talk about um, the the sort of also concurrent and and may, you know maybe n- not necessarily coincidental. I mean, you mentioned uh, Bernie Sanders, but um, in terms of like the 2020 primary, one of the impacts that we can see is you know in areas of antitrust. I think that has like largely been sort of like a you know a Elizabeth Warren's sort of people on some level, um, uh, but within the context of labor. Um, uh, certainly there's been influence from Bernie Sanders, uh, in in this, and the national labor relations board has been probably the most friendly to labor in decades. Um, it seems like put into context uh, for us, and then maybe they didn't all happen in 2023, uh, but the changes that have been implemented by the national labor relations board in terms of like organizing on the premises of 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 the workplace um and now the semex ruling um which you know uh, is in my estimation sort of like almost like hard check light and then what is needed to sort of like close the loop if if you will uh, uh on on empowering the the unions once they're unionized right so just to for the audience, so the Semex decision is a very recent ruling by the National Labor Relations Board, which says that if an employer commits an unfair labor practice, so violates some labor law um, to the to the gr- degree and seriousness that it would necessitate just scrapping a union election and holding another one. So if an employer does something that so messes up the election that you have to rerun it now under Semex, the employer just automatically is required to recognize the union instead. So that is card check light. Um, well, and also the entirely. the first part of it is that they don't necessarily the 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 people who want to unionize the workers who want to unionize yeah. don't necessarily have to have a vote. They can right. sign the card, and if there is over fifty uh, percent, the the employer has two weeks to respond and have right. a legitimate argument as to why they shouldn't right. uh, be unionizing. Yes. And then as far as the other things, Sam, that you mentioned, you know, being allowed to organize on the premises, you know, this is a really remarkable thing, right? Things that we just accept as normal in the United States, in the labor world, that, you know, there is, it almost is comical the ways that workers and their union representatives, when they're organizing a new campaign, have to try to, with sneaky tactics and at night and off the clock, steal lists of workers they're not allowed on the premises. It's really bizarre, right? Because the employer, of course, has constant access to the workforce. So this is one of the ways that union organizing in the U.S. is not a level playing field. And so, you know, you mentioned being able to organize on the premises. And this was a key intervention of the NLRB during the Amazon campaign at JFK 8 in Staten Island, which is still the only facility in the United States that has formally won an NLRB election at an Amazon facility. And so that was key because it meant that the organizers involved, all of whom were Amazon workers anyway, would not be chased off the premises when they were talking to a worker after their, you know, after their shift or during a break. You know, it gave a little more room to breathe. Um, And there are a few more interventions that Abruzzo, who's the head of the NLRB under Biden, has been making, you know, sort of aggressively finding in favor of workers who've been fired 
illegally in the NLRB's ruling, you know, especially at Starbucks. So demanding employers rehire workers who were fired. You know, the one thing I would say here, well, I guess two things. One is that workers certainly are going to try to make use of these rulings. You know, I was talking to an Amazon or to a UPS worker um, who's a Teamster. And, you know, the Teamsters are working hard to start building ties with the Amazon workers all across the country. This is one of their big kind of pledges is to help organize Amazon. And he said, we're, we think the Cenex ruling is really important. We're going to use that. We all have like, you know, we've memorized its ins, ins and outs, all of us working on these Amazon campaigns, and we're going to make use of it and run with it. Now, on the flip side, the NLRB, no matter how good the person in, at the top of it is, really is like a little, you know, it's like a little dog yapping at a giant human being that is, you know, the body of Amazon or Starbucks, you know, the monetary penalties this the board can impose upon a billion dollar company are like pennies, right? Even when a worker dies, you know, and there's there's a finding from OSHA that it was the company was negligent, that's usually just a couple thousand dollars. So imagine what it is for an employer that simply fires a worker rather than kills them. Um, this is this is I think I bring this up not to like demoralize people or bum people out, but because the other piece here is that workers have to feel and figure out a way to actually be able to, in practice, enforce their rights. So the workers can't, you can't wait on the NLRB to tell Amazon to bargain with you for a contract, which Amazon is refusing to do with the JFK right. union. They haven't even admitted that they recognize the validity of the union, much less bargained with it. You have to find a way to force them to, right? You cannot wait on the NLRB. And, you know, as we know, the NLRB may look very different come the end of this year, you know, with the presidential election, which is a huge setback, but also why you can't put all your eggs in that basket. Um, and so I think workers right now, part of kind of the not it's not a manic rush, but a sort of frenzy to to win new unions, to lock in gains, to make as much progress as you can right now is the sense that we're not going to have this environment forever. This environment being both the friendly NLRB but also the tight labor market, which really has been crucial, which started during the pandemic when, you know, famously employers said, we can't find anyone to work here. You know, obviously that makes it easier for workers to demand more if the re employer is more reliant on them. The labor market has, sh has loosened up a little bit since the heights of that, but it's still really historically low. It's, you know, the unemployment rate right now is something like 3.4, 3.5%. Um, and you hear that, if not in those words, all the time. You hear workers say, I can find another job if need be. You know, I'm not afraid of getting fired. I know I can find something else that that pays me as as poorly as this job. What? I'm too afraid to lose it. Um, that's that's a paraphrase of almost an exact quote from the, the first organizing director for the Trader Joe's United Union, another union that kind of is on the march this year. So that those factors, I think everyone is keeping in mind are time limited. And we don't know how long we have we being the entire working class in the U.S., have to kind of seize the moment. So that's my that's my analysis of, of how it's going and whether it's get, getting in for the long haul. We should say um, uh, that uh, folks can go back. I think it was in uh, the summer of 2022, we interviewed uh, Jamie Edwards, who's one of those uh, folks from right. Trader Joe's up in Hadley, Mass. Yep. Um, but all right, so uh, uh, one more question about the National Labor Relations Board and then more broadly. Sure. For them, because in particular, um, uh, uh, particularly because they have limited enforcement power. Mm -hmm. It seems like the big thing that needs to happen now in terms of Abruzzo as the, as the general counsel, that they need to get to a place where they can say, um, once unionization happens, if a contract doesn't, isn't offered uh, within a certain period of time, there's we go to arbitration or we go to mediation or we impose one uh that seems to me to be the really sort of like most important next step so that um amazon can't do what it's doing starbucks can't do what it's doing uh because it, it, it has been made a little bit easier and there's more of an impetus to unionize but now like the plan by uh management is let's make people demoralized about the value of that union by not mm -hmm. giving them a contract. What's your sense of, of, of the chance of that happening? And then just give us a sense of what you think you were going to see in 2024. 
the chance of what exactly happening? Well, so? of some type of measure where they take the next step where they say, if an, a contract is not offered within 365 days, right. that is a prima facie, a unfair labor practice. And therefore we move into immediately mediation or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, arbitration or whatever it is and impose a contract. Right. I think that's totally possible. And it's funny that, you know, I've just been, I'm working on a, a labor history podcast with some various academics, historians, organizers, and we were just covering 1934 when there were three general strikes in the United States. And, you know, arbitration was a big part of this. Mediation was a big part of resolving those strikes. You had FDR had just passed, you know, the NRA and that's empowering with Section 7 workers to have the right to organize, to collectively bargain. And yet what it looked like was you had employers who said, we object to the entire idea of unions. We're not going to sit down with them. And then you had workers who said, OK, well, what, what do you want us to do then? You know, there's nothing we can agree to if they won't fundamentally recognize the unions. And so then you saw this conflict shifted onto arbitration and mediation and lots of, you know, panicked sweat by those who were mediating as they tried to find a way to please these employers um, who really were the holdouts. And I, it's hard for me not to think of that coming up once again as the idea if were the NLRB or some other legislative reform to kind of be pushed forward that said, if you don't have a contract within a year, that is evidence of an employer bargaining in bad faith, you know, on its on its face with nothing else added. Um, you know, I, I imagine that would Amazon then what you have a mediator come in, you'd have anybody come in. I mean, it doesn't seem like anyone can force this unless workers say either we're striking until we get a contract or otherwise, you know, kind of forcing the employer's hand right. because these companies are willing to just take these hits, both re reputationally and legally. Um, that's my, there that's is my, something about knowing though, that you're explicitly on yes. the right side of the of the ruling or the law to empower that organizing i think yes, in, in my true. sense but that's true. all right so what do you think we're going to see in 2024 like in terms of like uh, are you aware of broad union strategies that you can you can tell us <laughs> yeah. about or what or yeah sure um i mean i know that the uaw is serving as kind of a like a pressure on a lot of other unions where i think a lot of members and staffers are saying look at what they're doing, we should be more like that. And what they're doing is one, starting to expend more money, more time on new organizing. You know, they won this stand-up strike at the big three. And within days, they go public with the claim and the and the aim to organize basically the entire non-union auto sector, which is now larger than the union auto sector. The majority of auto workers in this country are not members of any union, including the UAW. So they've already, you know, had public campaigns starting, especially in the South, at, you know, the Chattanooga Volkswagen um, giant plant. Now workers are signing cards there to join. So I think that kind of aggressive model that is also a part of this kind of democratization of the UAW, where you have a new rank and file reform caucus, UAWD, you have a leadership that is clearly very responsive to its members and rather than stymieing them or shutting them up as previous UAW leadership did. And so I think what we're gonna see is a question of, are other unions gonna take up these kind of internal reforms and this external aggression um, in organizing new sectors and also being less conciliatory with the employers? Um, so you might see more confrontation you know, Sean O'Brien also has been this way with UPS. You, that might be something that catches on, you know, an end to, to shaking hands with your employer as you are forced to, you know, sort of cut your own members' uh, pensions and pay. Um, the other kind of like main things people should keep in mind are Hollywood may once again see a really big strike this year. Um, you know, IATSE, which is the grips and electricians, you know, all the quote unquote below the line workers on a film set. Um, they are up for their contract is going to expire in July and they nearly struck the last time, which was really remarkable. IATSE is not a strike prone union. Right. These, these workers, just to keep it short, they, their schedules are unbelievable. You know, they get in car crashes trying to drive home after a 24 hour shoot or 16 hour No, it's hour ridiculous. Day. And, and then, also they don't have the margins that let's say a lot of the actors do. They haven't right. set up, um, on one hand, they don't have the margins that the uh, more successful actors do. And on the other hand, they don't have the second jobs that uh, actors who 
you know, have day jobs have. And right. so they're, they're in many instances, a lot more perilous. Well, Alex Press yeah. is fascinating, uh, but we got to go. Uh, we will put a link to your uh, retrospective of 2023 uh, in our podcast and YouTube description. Um, Alex Press, uh, if folks have not been regularly reading you in, in Jacobin uh, magazine. They're making a mistake. They should be doing that. Uh, thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate thanks so it. Thanks so much, Sam. All right, folks, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, Bill McKibben will be here to talk about uh, 2023 in the context of it, not just being uh, uh, hot in terms of labor, but also literally hot, uh, the hottest on record. We'll be right back. We are back, Sam Cedar on the majority report. Emma Vigeland out today. It is a pleasure to welcome back to the program Bill McKibben, contributing writer at the New Yorker, founder of thirdact.org, among other organizations in the past. Uh, Bill, good to see you. I know uh, we're talking to you uh, in Vermont. I just wanted to uh, uh, check and see. Uh, there was uh, anticipated a lot of flooding. There was a lot of flooding last year. You guys had as well um, uh, in a, in a similar situation. Um, uh, just uh, you know, I'm glad we got power. Snow. We had snow that turned to a driving rain up here in the mountains. So it's not supposed to be what's happening in January. But there you go. Brave new world. Yeah. Um, and and disturbing. And uh, you wrote a piece. Um, I guess it was about ten days ago about the odd silence that we saw about the 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 hottest year on record and just i guess it was just a day or two ago uh capricus i think it is um uh the european uh uh climate organization uh came out with that this was the hottest if you in include january to january january said the the hottest 12 months in as far as they could tell about 125,000 years um, maybe more, but certainly uh, in terms of our civilization um, and where people have been living and how they've been living, talk about like where we're at. I and mean, because you and I, I think I've interviewed you over the past 15 years or so, maybe more, where we're at in terms of the way our society, at least in this country, uh, and, and, and perhaps across like, you know, sort of uh, the, the industrialized world is sort of digesting or not digesting this information? Well, I mean, 
it is somewhat big news, 125,000 years. I mean, that takes us back even before the beginning of podcasting. Yes. And um, it's, uh, um, you know, I mean, in some ways, it seems like by far the biggest thing that happened in 2023. Um, but it's not at the top of the news. And in part, that's because, well, perhaps because it moves a tiny bit too slowly for the news to quite understand, though it's moving in the geological blink of an eye. Uh, and in part because there's been a long, long campaign of obfuscation and confusion about what's going on here. We're past the point where there are, aside from Donald Trump, many real climate deniers out there anymore. But there are plenty of climate delayers, and that's what the fossil fuel industry has become. Uh, the news today is that they've launched an eight-figure ad campaign in the U.S. just to uh, remind people that we need to keep producing oil and gas, which they do need to keep reminding people because we now live on a planet where sun and wind provide cheaper power. Uh, and if people actually figured that out, we'd be making quicker headway than we are. We're beginning, thanks to things like the Inflation Reduction Act, to get some traction in that transition but it's not going fast enough to catch up with the physics of climate change. So uh, the fight goes on. And I think 2024 is likely to be even warmer than 2023. So I'm afraid there'll be plenty of opportunity to continue making this case. What, what has struck me is that it is becoming more explicit in terms of like the cost associated, like the material cost associated in real time with uh climate change i mean like i say you know uh you're you we weren't sure if we you would have power to have this conversation this is not the first time that vermont has been hit by like you know sort of massive floods um the the there is no snow in the vast majority of new york state that lasts more than a couple of days on the uh, on the ground uh but meanwhile in the the midwest they're having uh, incredibly extreme weather we, we have floods rapidly. We have fires rapidly, you know, uh, more often um, like the it's almost like there's a slight disconnect on some level. Uh, uh, or is it that the, we haven't figured out a way to align the incentives that are associated with the costs of, you know, I mean, obviously they're much more extensive for other places. But like within the context of American society, have we not aligned the incentives of costs with understanding that we, that we need to in, in invest in or de-invest uh, to to mitigate these costs in the future? Does that make sense? Absolutely. I think one of the places where we may finally see that disconnect closing, and I think this may be one of the sleeper stories of this year is in the insurance industry. Um, they're beginning to write off whole states that they won't write coverage for anymore because climate risk has just gotten too large. If you can get coverage, the cost is going up, you know, doubling, tripling, so on and so forth. Um, and I think that that's kind of bringing home and will continue to bring home some of this message for people. The good news is that there's something we can do about it. As I say, renewable energy is now the cheapest form of energy we've got. So if we built it out quickly, we couldn't stop global warming. We're, that's not on the list of options, but we could slow it down to the point where we might be able to cope as a civilization with the pace of change. At the moment, we're just racing ahead and uh, all the auguries are, are tough. I mean, 2023 should have taught us that. Uh, even in, you know, relatively safe places like New York or Washington, we spent much of the year breathing the smoke from those tremendous fires in Canada. So there's really no escaping now what's happening. I will say that the, um, that the Biden administration faces a real opportunity right now. Uh, this big drive that's um, been happening all fall to get them to put a pause on building new export terminals for LNG is coming to a head. And uh, there'll be civil disobedience outside the DOE in February. And if the Biden administration does the right thing here and says, we're pausing the permitting of this stuff, 
until we can get good new, not decade old numbers about uh, the economic and environmental impact. If he did that, I think he'd have a credible case to make for having done more than any of his predecessors to take on dirty energy. It's a pretty low bar, uh, but he would, I, I think, clear it because otherwise the ongoing build out of this stuff is so extraordinary. Um, in 10 years time, if the industry gets everything they want, American LNG will be producing more greenhouse gas emissions than everything that happens on the con continent of Europe. So we've really got to rein this in. And, and I think Biden is capable of doing it. And I think if he does, he may be able to recoup some of the enthusiasm that he lost among especially young voters when they pulled that bonehead move and approved the big willow oil complex up in Alaska. So we're hopeful. This is a big year for a lot of reasons, obviously. All right. And we should just say that's February 6 to 8 uh, at the Department of Energy. Um, and, and you were one of the, um, uh, I guess, uh, the uh, signatories of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a letter that was sent and, and a call for that uh, sit in uh, with other uh, activists as well. Um, we, I was going to ask you within that context of like, you know, Biden, because at, at this right now, my understanding is. We are producing more oil than we have ever produced. Yeah, um, I mean, this is this is mostly the hangover of permits granted in the Obama and Trump years. And but yes, look, uh, uh, and so it's time for real choices. America went to Dubai with every, all the other countries of the world last month and signed a piece of paper saying the time has come to transition off fossil fuels. There's no definition of the word transition that includes building a vast new fleet of export terminals designed to last 50 years. Um, so Will you explain serious. that to us? I mean, walk us through, because I, I think like when we say uh, LNG build out, like where this is we're talking liquefied natural gas where does it where does it come from how does it get to these facilities where are these facilities proposed and the idea is that if you build a facility that's going to last for 50 years it's going to be used for 50 years yeah, that's because exactly right. the investment has already been made and, and this they is need all to that, recoup so this well, is all that fracked gas from the permian basin mostly louisiana and texas and that's right next to the Gulf Coast. So they're building these big export terminals to take this stuff off, mostly to Asia. Um, and in the process, of course, they drive up the price of natural gas for Americans who still need to use it for heating and cooking. Uh, so it's a loser all the way around unless you happen to be an oil company. And then it's, you know, a great way to get rid of your excess inventory of fracked gas. Um, the greenhouse gas implications are extraordinary and so are the environmental justice problems close to home in louisiana and texas and that's why people have been doing such a great job of building coalitions down there and finally happily uh the national environmental movement sort of catching on and backing them up so i think it's the biggest uh national environmental fight probably since maybe since the keystone or dakota access pipelines in a way but I think it's a place where Biden has great opportunity to do the right thing. Um, Jennifer Granholm just needs to say, look, um, after the hottest year in 125,000 years, we're going to pause and take a look and come up with a new set of criteria for determining what's in the public interest and not. And if they do that, honestly, they'll never build another one of these things. And that would be excellent. Let, can I walk through a little bit of what that public interest is and understand the, the dynamic here? So you have these frackers, they have all of these, uh, the, this excess uh, liquid uh, natural gas that they have, which of course drives the price down if it's used domestically, uh, because we already have the mechanism to get it to people uh, within, with, within domestically. But if they, if they build these export facilities, it's basically like, um them in they they've invested now in something that uh gives them more reason to punt, to uh to mine more i mean to uh, drill more to uh yeah. it, it, and the real problem is sam that, that 
if you keep providing this endless flood of cheap LNG to the rest of the world, it undercuts the transition to solar and wind, which is what we desperately need. So uh, the, the fight is on. It's a hard fight, um, but a winnable one. Uh, people can go to stoplng.org, I think, um, uh, for more details. And if you're in the D.C. area, to come help on February 6, 7, 8. Um, we're hoping that we can call the whole thing off because they do the right thing in the meantime. Um, but we're preparing to go down there. Uh, it always feels foolish to me to have to end up in handcuffs to try and get our leaders to pay attention to physics. But sometimes that's what it takes. And if it's what it takes, then uh, uh, willing to do it. <laughs> But it also it also seems like, I mean, just from the most crass sort of like uh, political incentives, um, if that permitting is delayed, it will mean that uh, there is pressure on these um, LNG uh, producers to get rid of some of their excess stock, it seems to me. It would drive it would be, prices down for Americans. It would be a real, it would be an actual inflation reduction act. Right, I mean, it would, it would, it would, and, and I would imagine going into an election year, again, with the most crass, sort of like uh, hurt, incentive structures, um, that's something Biden would wanna do. And it, and it gives, I, I guess like the idea that it's not already happening that way gives an idea to the forces array uh, uh, um, uh, aligned. Hey, big, oil is, big oil is big. They got lots of money. They got lots of friends. Uh, cross them at your peril. Um, but there's a lot more voters who care about uh, the future of the planet than there are who care about the future of Exxon's balance sheet. So uh, hopefully we'll make some progress. I've got to jump, Sam. To okay, yes. Go, uh, go uh, all of this. We will but, put a uh, link to uh, stoplng.org on our uh, podcast and absolutely. website description. And Look, thanks so if much. If anyone's keeping their powder dry, you know, this is the time. 125,000 years. Uh, we're seeing some new stuff that no humans have ever seen before. So let's take it seriously. All right. Thanks so much, Bill McKibben. Always a pleasure. Take care, brother. Bye bye. bye. All right, folks. We will put a link to uh, stoplng.org. Uh, in again, like I say, into the podcast and YouTube descriptions and at majority.fm. Um, and it will be three days of rallies and civil disobedience. Again, the dates are, well, it's, um, uh, it's just a little bit under a month, February 6th to 8th um, in D.C. And the idea is to pressure the Biden administration um, to uh, essentially slow the roll of these export facilities. Um, this is all... I mean, and, and, and again, just, you know, uh, to make it clear, it is, if I, I get a choice here in this uh, studio, for instance, okay? Um, if I think I'm only going to do this show for another uh, 12 months, I'm okay with uh, cameras that don't do 4K, but if I go buy brand new cameras that are 4K, then I'm like, I've got to uh, do this show for another 10 years so I can pay off these cameras and get back to, you know, and make the returns on the cameras. Now, I have a slightly different incentive structure in real life because the softer the focus, the less people can tell how yeah. old I am. But if I buy a new gaming PC, it means I'm going to be doing a lot more gaming in the future. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it's very simple there. And then the thing is, for the Biden administration, there is, again, all of this excess LNG, uh, this oil production that came from all the permitting that uh, Obama and particularly Trump did. Uh, you know, they permit these things. You can't. There are no legal means in which to tell oil companies we're going to stop you from, from doing these things, uh, from, you know, producing your oil at this point, you can only derive policies that can inhibit their profit motive. And most importantly, the incentive structure for people to invest in it. If Matt has to get money from his folks to upgrade his gaming system, and they're like, well, we're not going to get the returns on this we want. Uh, then Matt's just not going to get those gaming systems. And how do we, you know, 
in this metaphor, you know, convinced If you want me home better. for Thanksgiving, don't get me the new gaming PC. <laughs> exactly. There you go. Um, so that's, that's that. Um, just a reminder, folks, again, it's your support that makes this show possible. You can become a member at jointhemajorityreport.com. Uh, when you do, you not only get the uh, fun half, you get the free half free of commercials. Uh, jointhemajorityreport.com. Also, don't forget justcoffee.coop, Fair Trade Coffee, featuring the Majority Report blend. Um, they've got other coffees there, too. A great organization. Um, movement Partners. Uh, they have been there, uh, well, they've been w sponsoring this show since the very, very beginning. Actually, before this show. Back when it was- Before I was here, sir. Break Room Live, when Marin and I were doing a show is where we started to do it. And uh, they were giving out coffee. I'm looking right now at a sign uh, from the uh, 2011 protest against Scott Walker, where he began a lot of these sort of like things that we're just now as a society catching up to and pushing back on like um the uh assault on unions and uh the assault on, on health care um and they were out there giving out free coffee for protesters uh in madison so uh check them out esvn this week what's you guys doing some type of special tomorrow yeah i'm filling in for bradley tomorrow i'm gonna try to uh, pull the focus on to my minnesota timberwolves i emma's probably going to uh, start talking about the knicks now that they're performing uh well so uh after the og and Inobi trade so check that out tomorrow on esvn um and what's happening on left reckoning yeah left reckoning we had sadeep bhattacharya on to uh who's a, a socialist and a phd candidate over at Rutgers, and to talk about uh, south asian politics in america how say dave rubin um uh views it versus how socialists should and uh oh also in the uh post game david griscom and i got into the bill ackman wife plagiarism kerfuffle that's going on where bill ackman had his lawyers use the Wayback Machine to find out that MIT didn't explicitly mention Wikipedia in, its in, in 2009. <laughs> and I'll just say, as somebody who was in college in 2009, the reason that later the guidance had to be, uh, okay, you can cite Wikipedia, but you have to do this, that, and the other, was prior to that, they said even that was too much. So don't do any sort of uh, right. Wikipedia at all, <laughs> um, not even citing it properly. So yeah. Um, the professors didn't let you just pull um, straight from Wikipedia in 2009. Um, I know Bill, but anyway, we got deep into that. Patreon.com says Left Reckoning. It's great how billionaires and their lawyers can, like, they have how much money that his, their lawyers got just from plugging stuff into the Wayback Machine. I mean, that's what's so awesome if you're a billionaire. It's just like, I have a thought and I have the resources to have people do an absolutely idiotic thing, even if it costs like tens of thousands of dollars. <laughs> Nutty Dan says, what's LNG? Again, that's liquefied natural gas. That's all the fracking stuff. The liquefied natural gas is supposedly the thing that was our, our bridge fuel. The problem is, is that it's not a bridge fuel if you set it up to be even more commodified than it is now. So for it to be genuinely a bridge fuel, what we need to do is burn through it instead of like create incentives to sell more of it. And produce more of it and, and, and drill more of it. Again, like all you can do as a government at this point with those things is to inhibit the future prospects for these things. Um, Ramona says a few days ago in New Hampshire, we had the first snow to actually accumulate this winter. Today, it's about 50 degrees. Almost all the snow is gone. Yeah, without a doubt. That's a dynamic all over the place, at least in the Northeast. Have you read my email? So the majority report won't be 4K because Sam is old. Correct. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how else to say that, but yeah. Yep. Uh, Brooklyn Sue says, I'm watching on a 15-year-old laptop, so it's totally okay if you don't improve the cameras. There you go. Um, expert dog kisser. In 2000, we had professors telling us not to cite Wikipedia in syllabus. Uh, syllabus. Um, Squirt Cobain, I feel so, I felt so stupid when I realized Just Coffee didn't mean it's a company that sells only coffee, 
but it's a coffee company that is just. I'm not sure I play on words. Yeah, there you go. Yes. All right, folks, quick uh, break. 646-257-3920. We'll take phone calls in just a moment. Left is best. Jamie and I may have a disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right to mock them on YouTube. He's up there buggy whipping like he's the boss. I am not your employer. You know, I'm tired of the negativity. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. You're nervous, you're a little bit uh, upset, you're riled up. Yeah, maybe you should rethink your defense of that, you fucking idiots. We're just going to get rid of you. All right. But dude. 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 Uh, you want to smoke this joint? Yes. <laughs> Do you feel like you are a dinosaur? <laughs> <laughs> it's a good shit. Exactly. I'm happy now. It's a win-win. It's a win-win-win. Oh, hell yeah. Now listen to me. Two, three, four, five times. Eight, four, seven, nine, oh, six, five, oh, one, four, five, seven, two, thirty-eight. 56, 27, one half, five eighths, 3.9 billion. Wow. He's the ultimate math nerd, don't you see? Why don't you get a real job instead of spewing vitriol and hatred, you left wing limbaugh? Everybody's taking their dumb juice today. Come on, Sammy. Dance, dance, dance. Grandpa. I had my first post coital scene with uh, a woman. I'm hoping to add more moves to my repertoire. All I have is the dip and the swirl. Fine, we can double dip. Yes, this is a perfect moment. No. Wait, what? You make under a million dollars a year. You're scum. You're nothing. Excuse me? Fuck you, you fucking liberal elite. I think you belong in jail. Thank you for saying that, Sam. You're a horrible, despicable person. All right, going to take a quick break. I want to take a moment to talk to some of the libertarians out there. Take whatever vehicle you want to drive to the library. What you're talking about is jibber jab. Classic. I'm feeling more chill already. Good. Donald Trump can kiss all of our asses. Hey, Sam. Hey, Andy. Are you guys ready to uh, do some evil? Hitler was such an idiot. You think I might be a Nazi? Agree. No. Death to America. You. Yes. Wow. Wow, that's weird. No way! Unbelievable. This guy's got a really good hook. Throw our hands up. <laughs> Ooh. Wow. Um, but Sam, I gotta get off. No worries. Let's, let's, I want to just flesh this out a little bit. I mean, look, it's a free speech issue. If you don't like me... Hey, 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 shut up! Thank you for calling into the Majority Report. Sam will be with you shortly. We are back, ladies and gentlemen. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report. Um, thanks for joining us. And what else? We didn't get that um, that clip from More Perfect Union in the sound post that I put. Did you even look in Slack? The one, um, the Jim Harbaugh. Oh. Actually, I was kind of saving that for Emma, but. Oh, you were? Okay, no, it's fine. Actually, I was thinking that's probably best to do. Um, but, uh, and where's that, uh, where's that, uh, uh, Michelle Obama for president? You're saving all the good stuff for Emma. I didn't see the Michelle You put that in there. Did I? Oh my God. <laughs> Matt, like, so we have a slack. Which channel where we put all the uh, the uh, clips and and I see Matt put in something at one thirty eight a.m. last night that he oh, did not remember <laughs> that he had done. Um, that is uh, impressive. Oh, oh, you're talking about the PBD thing? Yeah. yeah. Well, no, that's the thing I forgot to put it. So it, that's PBD on uh, yoga pants. Um, <laughs> we can maybe get to that. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's time. low, low, low priority. Um, but it's just, it's fun to watch Matt's process, uh, when you can see at what time at night, what he's doing at one thirty-five in the morning. I decided to watch, uh, PBD on four times speed. Last <laughs> <night>. <laughs> the PBD 
was on the four times speed. Matt was on like the uh, three quarters speed himself. Yeah, I, I slowed myself down and sped up PBD. <laughs> um, Anthony Blinken is in. Uh, it really is. Uh, you know, I, I th there there was a lot made. At the beginning of the Obama administration, he gave a couple of speeches in the Middle East. I think one in Egypt in particular, where he 